sorry. Mr. Bozeman is here. Um, where's the uh, front? Okay. Uh, today on our fourth panel, we welcome the Honorable Allison Hickey, Under Secretary for Benefits from the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. She is accompanied by Mr. Alan Bozeman, Director of Veterans Benefits Management System, Program Management Officer at the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, and by the Honor Honorable Roger Baker, Assistant Secretary for the Office of Information Technology for the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs as well. At this time, uh, we will recognize General Hickey for five minutes for your testimony. Uh, good morning, Chairman Stutzman, Ranking Member Filner, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. I am accompanied by Mr. Roger Baker, the Assistant Secretary for Information and Technology, and Mr. Alan Bozeman, the Director of the Ven Veterans Benefits Management System, or VBMS, Program Office. My testimony today will focus on VBA's transformation plan, with particular focus on the new paperless IT system known as VBMS. Combined with 40-plus additional designed, tested, and measured initiatives in VBA's comprehensive transformation plan, VBMS will provide electronic claims processing capabilities critical to achieving the Secretary's 2015 goal of eliminating the backlog and processing all claims at 98 percent quality. The bottom line, VA must deliver timely first-rate benefits and services with greater efficiency and effectiveness than we do today. We cannot do this by using old tools and processes. The magnitude of this change requires a comprehensive and integrated plan, which VA developed in collaboration with our stakeholders within 45 days of my swearing in. We are implementing that plan today. As we work to transform how we do business through new people, process, and technology initiatives, at the end of the day, our transformation is about taking care of our veterans and their loved ones. I am proud of VBA employees, 51% of them who are veterans themselves, who have processed over one million disability claims in each of the last two years, an unprecedented number. We did this while at the same time allocating 37% of our rating staff to processing Agent Orange claims, putting over $3.6 billion into the hands of our Vietnam veterans and their survivors. Since October 2010, we have dedicated over 1,200 skilled raters to completing these Agent Orange NEMR claims. All NEMR claims for living veterans have been completed, and we are now focusing on fewer than 274 remaining that will benefit survivors and next of kin. This means we can now redirect over 1,200 skilled raters to the claims backlog. Despite unprecedented VBA claims production, completing over one million claims each year for the last two, VA's backlog has grown. We have received an unprecedented growth in claims, nearly 48% more than three years ago. Included in this growth, 45% of the 1.6 million veterans who have honorably served more than a decade of war in Iraq and Afghanistan and are rightfully, rightfully filing claims, but at unprecedented levels. Thankfully, these dedicated men and women are 10 times more likely than previous generations to have survived the multiple deployments they've selflessly made, but they are returning home with triple the medical issues of previous generations, driving the complexity of these claims and their associated, associated workload to an all-time high. As a result, VBA is aggressively pursuing its transformation plan, a series of tightly integrated initiatives. Our people initiatives focus on how we're organized and trained to do this mission. Our employees are key to our success, and over 51% of them are veterans themselves working hard for other veterans. People initiatives include segmented lanes based on claim complexity, cross-functional teams designed to work claims from start to finish, and a redesign of our entire national training program with dramatic results already. Our process improvement initiatives, some of them include our quality review teams in every office designed to assess our quality throughout the process, not just inspected at the end. 16 rules-based calculators built to assist decision makers in assigning an accurate result the first time. During testing, quality improved from 83 to 92 percent. 
Our VRM initiative is one of our technology initiatives. It now gives veterans access to information from multiple channels, on the phone, online, and through eBenefits. All call centers have designed new technology, new callback features. Recently, we deployed two, and we have successfully had three million veterans use them. Our eBenefits portal lets our veterans, 73% who say they want to meet us online, do so easily. The, they include 41 self-service options, and veterans are downloading more than 120,000 benefit letters a month. The ability to file a veteran's claim online, like you file your taxes online today, and more than 1.5 million users representing 500% increase since January 2011. VBMS is the cornerstone of our transformation plan, will dramatically reduce the amount of paper in the current process, employ rules-based claims development. The team developing VBMS is using a tailored agile approach. Version 3 is currently in user acceptance testing with national deployment coming soon and to be completed by the end of the calendar year 2013. We are developing many multiple channels or intake capabilities to include scanning, a data interface, and direct transfer of data into the VA system from our stakeholders and partners. In conclusion, uh, inclusion, Chairman, VBMS, along with other 40 other people, process, and technology transformation initiatives, is critical to our access, success in meeting the needs of our veterans, their families, and survivors, and we are committed to deliver on this plan. This concludes my statement, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, General Hickey, and I will uh, begin the questioning. Uh, veterans are one of the most honored and most vulnerable groups in our great nation, and uh, the American public has entrusted the VA, specifically the VBA, with providing them with the benefits that they were promised, benefits that many of them desperately require as they reassimilate into civilian life. With this in mind, the backlog, processing time, and rate of error seems to have become the norm rather than the exception, and this is unacceptable. As leader of VBA, it is your responsibility to ensure that the management and culture of your department align with the agency's mission and goals. Though we wholeheartedly support VBA's efforts to transform its operations, and indeed we do have faith in some of your initiatives, it is also our job as a committee and as, as Congress to ensure that VBA is not merely developing a Band-Aid for a bullet wound in the form of a vast array of initiatives that quite honestly lack focus and direction and which may only serve to distract your agency from addressing the root causes of these issues. It it's been suggested that VBA lacks a sense of urgency and an inability to follow through in addressing these problems. General Hickey, one would expect that the tough economy, the tight fiscal climate, and the failure for VA to turn the corner on quality and timely claims process in the senior executive service averaging over $11,000. How many of those bonuses went to VBA employees? Chairman Stutzman, I will tell you we have a very stringent and rigorous process at VBA for, um, for bonuses for our senior executives. And we use those processes with very hard metrics. In fact, there are 98 metrics that we measure on largely in the categories of production, Quality, yes, we measure our SESs against quality standards that they produce in their organizations and that they lead. We also assess them against training requirements. Yes, we check to see that they are validating training is being done and that people are being provided their training. And we also, on a number of other uh, avenues, including leadership and their ability to run their organizations. in your central office headquarters? So most of our performance awards are awarded to the GS-12 and below. Um, our total awards uh, paid in FY11 was approximately um, 100, that's EA, I'm sorry, that's VA's performance, 186 million. Um, and, but I will tell you, our performance awards in VBA, our number of outstandings, significantly, we, we significantly lowered those in order to tie to performance standards and expectations associated um, with a leadership uh, in the transformation model. You never answered the question, ma'am. You asked how, how many people? Do you, have, do you have that number? Do you have how many people? 
Chairman, I have a number that says one third of the total of outstandings we, uh, that, uh, we, that we had done in 2009 is what we do today. One third? One third of the total we used to do in 2009 is all we give out today. Do you know what that number was in 2009? Yes, it, I do not know, but I can get that for you and bring that back to you for the record. Okay. For both VBA and SES employees, how do you justify when the agency's goals and performances have not um, measurements have not been met. How, how do you justify bonuses? I mean, you, you look at what um, people across this country are doing today, and when times are tough, and when the, the goal is not being met, and we continue to fall behind, how do we justify giving taxpayer dollars and bonuses to those who are responsible for the program? So thank you, Chairman uh, Stutzman, for your question. I will say, you know, the, it's important to note that we have very high-performing regional offices and very good senior leaders in those offices that are driving high performance, um, that are exceeding the production standards, that are exceeding the quality standards, uh, that are producing for our veterans and their families and survivors in a very good way. Uh, so from our perspective, this is it's not an all-up or all-down vote. Uh, from our perspective, I need to encourage and I need to draw in strong leadership to lead us through these very challenging times. And oftentimes, in order to, uh, to really attract and retain that superb leadership, you have to do uh, things like offer bonuses for high performance. But, but, but you know, it's the, the responsibility lies at the top. And if we are not meeting our veterans, um, the, the responsibility that we have for our veterans and the benefits that they are waiting for and deserve, um, at what point does leadership step up and, and make changes, big changes, to, to meeting the problems that we have? Because I, mean, I know you, I hope you understand that with when the general public sees that bonuses are being given out and our veterans are waiting for benefits, this doesn't add up. Thank you, Chairman Stutzman, for your question. Uh, what I will tell you is that um, uh, the, at the very top uh, of the Benefits Administration is me. I take responsibility for what happens in the Ven Veterans Benefits Administration. I also take very seriously and have grown up in the Department of Defense knowing the importance of really good leadership uh, in driving performance and in driving quality. And in that respect, I believe that you should reward those who do meet the mark uh, in that respect, and that is what we do in VA. But, you know, I'm a small business owner, and if the job doesn't get done, you, you find somebody that does do it. And, you know, whether it's bonuses or whether it's pay and salary, um, you find somebody to get the job done. In, in 2010, only 36% of claims took over 125 days to process. In 2011, that number jumped to 60% of claims. Now in 2012, the number of claims taking over 125 days to process is at 65 percent, despite hiring 3,000 new full-time employees in 2011. What's going to change? So, Chairman Stutzman, thank you for, for uh, bringing up uh, that point, because I just want to uh, clarify uh, that, uh, and I said it in my opening statement, but I will say it again. We have done unprecedented numbers of claims in those same last two years that you described. More than one million. In 2008, we did 800,000. We are doing one point, we're getting 1.3 million claims in the door that we're working on. During that same period of time, those same senior leaders led us through the very complex, absolutely right thing to do by our Vietnam veterans. 260,000 new Agent Orange NEMR claims that we worked at the same time as we work today's veterans' claims. 37% of our workforce take to, it took to do those claims. At the same time, those same leaders were leading um, our loan guarantee capability where we kept 73,000 veterans in their homes last year, and that was even 10% more than the previous year. The, these same leaders do not just leave our, lead our compensation areas, they lead all of our five business lines. They were leaders in the areas of our education claims where they drove the numbers down from 59 to, to 30 uh, in terms of the days it took to complete our education claims. Same leaders making those same decisions in that same effort, not just focused on compensation claims, focused on homeless veteran claims, uh, focused on uh, our uh, 
our efforts to bring on VBMS, many of them piloting new initiatives, many of them driving the challenge training to improve the quality of our performance. We are not a single area senior leader at that level. We have many business lines that meet the needs of our veterans. Thank you. I'll recognize Mr. Filner for his questions. Let me be honest, Madam Secretary. I, found, I find your testimony incredibly astounding. You sat here for three hours listening to all kinds of problems, listening to all kinds of perceptions, listening to all kinds of data that the system is broken. According to your testimony, nothing is wrong. Absolutely nothing. Everybody is all blah, 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 blah. Everything is happy. I'm so proud. If somebody of my constituents is sitting here who's had waited three years for a, for a uh, claim adjustment and heard your statement, they would throw up. Several, many have committed suicide while waiting for your bureaucracy to give them a response, and they don't see one. And the respect that we have that you, sh you show for us is absolutely astounding. We said three hours worth of stuff. Not one thing did you ever mention. Not one thing did you ever respond to. Not one thing did you ever say either, Congressman, you're wrong or Congressman, you're right. You went through with your standard thing as if you didn't sit here for three hours. What the hell were you here for? You hear things. You respond to things. You didn't. And if you look to me, if you want to know what the answer is here, if everything is fine, nobody's going to fix anything. And that's what your testimony said. Everything is fine. Oh, we have all these different, uh, we had all these um, the new Viet uh, Vietnam era claims. Well, tell us that you had 250,000, you need more resources to do it. Don't use it as an excuse that you couldn't do your job. You have not done your job, Madam Secretary. You, we gave you 12,000 new employees over the last few years. The backlog has doubled. The error rate has gone up to 25%. And you say everybody is doing their job to a high level. You have 98 metrics. My constituent has one metric. Have you given him a timely and accurate answer? And you haven't. You haven't. And you haven't explained why. And if you're at the top, and if you're responsible, as you just said you were, are you responsible for the fact that we had a doubling of the claims, that we've put this incredible number of new personnel in, that our error rate is up to 25,000? You didn't answer what I said I was going to ask you. A simple little error had occurred in your... Uh, in your temporary disability, whatever it's called. They asked for you to put on the next date for a review hearing. A year and a half later, that has not been done. Are you responsible for that? Are you responsible for not answering how we save a billion dollars, potentially? Who deserves a merit pay increase for that? Who, who deserves a bonus for that? How come that, was, that, that we haven't put on the, uh, the next appointment date on the electronic records for the, uh, the people who have temporary uh, ratings of 100%, uh, I guess? A year and a half. Why, have, why, don't we have the, when are we, why don't we have that? Is that your fault, Ms. Hickey? I'm glad. It's, thank, thank me for the question first. Yeah. the system that would drop the date out of the country. Oh, you know, I said to you when you were sitting there, don't give me an impersonal responsibility. A glitch occurred. Oh, there was this a glitch on the shelf that occurred. And, we, and you haven't fixed it in a year and a half. If it was so simple, Ms. Hickey, why haven't you fixed it? It will be fixed. This is January 2011, it was noted. Congressman is fixed on the 30th of June. On what? The 30th of June. That's a year and a half. Why did it take so long? Congressman Filner, we did not know that it was a computer glitch. We were retraining everyone to make sure they filled in the date. They were filling in a the date. A year and a half, and you didn't know it. So you deserve high ranking for your leadership for that. Who's responsible for it? Don't tell me about a glitch. Who didn't do their job? 
Who? Is it you? Congressman Filner, I've been uh, in this job for one year. This oh, week. now it's going to be because you weren't there. So everything starts when you arrived. So everybody should actually redo their disability claim because you arrived a year later. In fact, Congressman, uh, in this case, uh, if I can uh, clarify for the rest of the committee, the 100% um, uh, temporary disability claims are actually advantageous to the veteran uh, when of we don't they redo are. them. So now you're telling me it took you a year and a half because it was so advantageous to the veteran. It's also advantageous to give them their check the minute that their claim arrives. Why aren't you having, haven't you done that? You have an answer for everything except personal responsibility. Who is responsible? Congressman Filner, I've already arrived, said I, I am arrived or the glitch occurred. Who is responsible? I am. Okay, then why should we give you any kind of merit or even a continuation of your position if you are responsible for these failures? Because we have developed a plan, and that plan is a very good and very have, solid do we plan. we have the plan? We have incorporated the great ideas. Do we ideas. have the plan? We do have a plan. Do we have the plan? Sir, I have delivered that plan to this, the uh, Vet House Veteran Affair Committee staff. I'm happy to deliver it to anyone else in here who would like. Has anybody received this plan? We're into it, uh, what, a year, year and a half? How many years are we into it? Has anybody received this plan? We had a briefing with Under Secretary Hickey on the plan. Um, it was some slides and a PowerPoint presentation, but I'm not sure uh, if we specifically have anything that says this is the there plan. There is no plan, Ms. Hickey. There is no transformation. It's a fossil formation. It is the same arguments, the same ideas, the same failures that we've been looking at. I have been here for 20 years looking at the same damn thing. And you just started, so you're doing the same damn thing again. We don't have a plan. We have 40 initiatives. There is no, there is no uh, focus. There is no measure. There is no continuity. There is no evaluation. There is there's no plan. You just put out 40 things. And we're doing the same 40 things we've done before. We're just doing them, I don't know, more rigorously. You pay $10 million for scanning advice. How much is it going to cost us to scan everything that uh, you asked for, for, that you paid for? Congressman Filner, I'd like to answer your first question uh, that you asked or uh, statement that you made and clarify um, that I have a difference of opinion, uh, and that is we are, do not have the same plan. We are not retreading old things. We are fundamentally changing. The Give me way one we do thing that we're fundamentally doing different. Fundamentally changing it, all focused how, give me, on how we give me an example. If I'm a veteran, I come in with a claim. What has changed? That what has changed is that your claim will now be handled in a paperless environment. Your, ha your claim oh, will now oh, be done in a... That's not true, and you know it. You just oh, went through pilots that they, they're doing it in a few places. Where is it paperless? I, I'd be happy to talk to you about a specific... Well, talk example. me now. I will do that, sir. So let me talk to you about rules-based processes. And how long does it take, this new paperless process? Uh, we have uh, completed uh, uh, in the pilots these claims in about 120 days. Oh, now days. it's a pilot. Ranking member, I, I think the general has the right to answer. I, I think we should keep in mind yeah, here. She's this giving is a, us baloney. This is an Air Force general who was in our first class yeah, of female warriors. Everything is fine, some. according to her. I think she should be allowed to finish If she was a answer. general and gave the commander-in-chief such a report, she'd be fired. I'll yield back. The chair will remind the committee, let's let the witness answer the questions um, once the question is asked. Mr. Michaud. Thank you very much. Uh, several questions. Uh, the first few are to ask for information. Uh, you mentioned the metrics that, that you deal with as far as bonuses and, and raises. Would you provide the committee with the metrics that you utilize? Uh, I would be happy to do that, Congressman okay, Michaud. Thank you. Uh, the second thing, there's been a lot of discussion about the transformational plan. Uh, we've seen uh, on the website the initiatives, but could you also provide the committee with the actual transformational plan uh, that I will, you have? I will be happy to do that, and I will be happy at your request to come speak to you, talk to you about it, and walk you through it. Okay, thank you. Uh, the third is last time uh, looking at uh, uh, some of the problems uh, in the different regions as far as accuracy and timeliness of approving um, uh, individual veterans' claims. Uh, I asked for a copy of the different regions, the turnover rate uh, w within those regions. Uh, could you provide that to the committee as well as far as staffing? Because I find that tends to be some of the problem areas is with, when you have a high turnover rate because of it's not an employer of choice, uh, so to speak. So could you provide that to the committee as well? 
Uh, I, I will do that, uh, Congressman Michaud. I will also say that some of our turnover uh, is not related to employer of choice. It's related to normal attrition relative, relative to retirements and, and, uh, and populations that move to new locations. Uh, again, I tell you that 51 percent of our veterans, are, are, our employees are veterans, and sometimes they move uh, to different environments to, uh, as, as a choice. Yeah, if you can provide that. Uh, looking at the Inspector General's report, uh, and I mentioned it earlier, uh, when you look at the, uh, the VERO staff, uh, the error rate of 45% well, for the TBI claims, but at the bottom of that paragraph, it talked about the rating veteran service representatives uh, told the Inspector General that they did not return the inadequate reports due to pressure to meet uh, productivity uh, standards. Uh, is there any standards that uh, you have set to the different regions to just try to get the numbers up there to get it out there and that's why we, we have a lot of problems with the error rate? Congressman Michelle, I will tell you that is not an acceptable policy. That is not one that I have uh, given and, and mandated and directed. Um, we do not want to pass errors by. We want to solve errors. In fact, what we have done recently in one of the, the transformation initiatives is to put quality review teams in every single one of our regional offices. Never done before. Never done before. These folks are star trained, our big team that looks at all of our quality accuracy and is well respected by this committee and others. They are trained by them and they are looking for those places in our system, in the process, instead of just inspecting at the end. And, and they are taking those in process checks and they are uh, making sure that's they get okay. I, I, I just want to know whether or not there was a policy as far as just getting claims out. And that's one of the reasons why I want the metrics to, to be able to see if there's a lot of emphasis paid on that versus other areas. Uh, do you have a plan in place if uh, VBMS uh, fails? Is I don't believe you. plan? So, so I will start this and then I will deflect no, or defer no, no, no. to. Well, well, for, is there a backup plan, yes or no? So part of the reason why we have built an integrated plan that includes people, process, and technology initiatives so, is to buy down any risk of any kind in nature. Okay. All right. And so so, we, so I, I, got, I got a lot of questions. My time's running short. So right now you think it's going to work. There is no backup plan, correct? There isn't. Uh, it's unnecessary to have a backup plan at this okay, point. We have okay. seen it work. All right. How do you define uh, VA's uh, success under the VBMS uh, uh, in each steps of the implementation? Uh, do you have any definitions of success under that particular program? Our, our success factor is and always has been since the moment the Secretary said it is our agency priority goals that we will do claims in 125 days, 98 percent quality in 2015. Okay. Now, now, how do you, can you provide the committee on how many, because uh, the concern I heard from some uh, VSOs and veterans is is the goalpost is moving as far as what is a backlog and what is an error rate. Uh, could you provide the, the committee or do you have it on your website? I don't think it's on your website, but uh, as far as an ongoing uh, visual, like on Monday you have X claims uh, 30 days behind, 60 days, uh, 90, and, and exactly what the, the problems uh, are in that area? So Congressman Show as part of our transformation plan, VBA has uh, presented all of its uh, metrics in the Aspire database that is available to the public and anyone can look at it at any point in time. I will tell you that we are focused on both production and quality and we are now adding a three-month rolling quality average to see the effects of these initiatives that we've placed them in and we have seen a full four percentage point increase in our quality in the last quarter. Uh, my, my last, last question is, uh, I heard from some veterans, and I know uh, PVA uh, mentioned it a little bit earlier, and I'm following up with PVA. Uh, when you look at, we have a Department of Veterans Affairs, and sometimes, whether it's VHA or VBA, they tend to work in silos. And some of the concerns I heard were the doctors within VHA and doctors within VBA, sometimes VBA doctors, since they get to approve the claim, will not accept what a VHA doctor has to say. Uh, is that an accurate statement? And are there ways where you can break down the silo between VBA and VHA? 
Uh, Congressman Show, thank you for asking that question, affording me the opportunity to clarify. VBA does not have doctors. VBA has VHA doctors who come and sit in our VBA resource, uh, in our regional offices, and they help us do some of the, uh, the medical decisions that we need. But we do not have doctors in VBA. I will tell you, from the perspective of VHA and VBA working more collaboratively, we are doing that. We have an entire group of people now that work on a regular day-to-day -day basis between VHA and VBA on these claims. It, so where does those doctors come from though? Is it in the same area? They come from the VHA's, VHA has um, compensation exam physicians and that's where they come from, from VHA, okay. from the Veterans Health Administration. It, well, why wouldn't you just accept a VHA doctor's recommendations versus having another maybe VHA doctor in VBA questioning another VHA doctor? So, Congressman Michaud, I will clarify again, we do not have doctors in VBA. They do not exist in VBA. We have doctors in the health administration, and we rely on them for medical opinions, and we also rely on private medical physicians for their, their opinions. So the doctor in VHA that you use, they can question another doctor in VHA. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I'm just saying that, that our doctors come from VHA. So, 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 they, so they can question another VHA doctor then? They can have an engaging conversation. I'm sure they do all the time to collaborate over issues of veterans' health. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think we ought to work this out because I heard that there is a problem. And, uh, you know, the, if you have a VHA doctor saying something, then there should not be another VHA doctor that works with VBA to be able to question that. So I think that might be one way we can try to streamline the process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Waltz. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to note that the, the ranking member for passion for veterans is, is never in question. And I, as a veteran, have benefited from that. So I understand the frustration. I also think it is important, though, and, and my point with, with the general and with many in VA is that commitment is there. Uh, general Hickey was the first class of female warriors to graduate from the academy, one of our first pilots that came out of that. So I think that part of the transformation trying to get at this, it certainly doesn't relieve that responsibility, but all of us together trying to figure this out, um, I think we can get there. My, my question to you, um, Under Secretary, this, I'm going to go this bat, this last one that you went to, this VBA, VHA. VBA and VHA are co-located in the Sioux Falls Regional Office. They had some of the best processing and highest quality of claims. The new system forced them to send those somewhere else, and my veterans in southwest Minnesota, northern Iowa, and South Dakota have seen claims times go up. And, and their fear is, is that as we try and take massive claim times down in other areas, that we're pushing up and reaching the lowest common denominator instead of asking everyone to try and come to that high level of excellence. Was that taken into consideration? Because there's a feeling amongst some very highly qualified and passionate folks in your, under your command that they were doing great work and the system actually didn't really benefit them. They actually went away from that. Is, how do you explain that? Because I think that co-location was a key point that Mr. Michaud was bringing up. They're, they're right there. I could walk across the street to one another. So, Congressman Waltz, um, I will tell you that we, are, we work very hard to do and keep uh, our claims for our veterans in the states in which they're in. There are times when uh, a particular regional office, because of a surge deployment, and, and I'll say, you know, when you have an entire Army uh, group that comes back from a particular region, that can get very heavy on that regional office very quickly, especially if it's a National Guard or Reserve unit that's located in that state and stays in that state. And so there are times when we look to say, how can we rebalance the load so that we can effectively get more and more of those claims done? Because I'm trying to figure this out. I come at this in civilian sector as it's some the military experience, but also as a cultural studies person trying to break this. The one thing I think we have to recognize here is, too, the, the common denominator over the last 20 years is Congress, too. We've been here this whole time. Our job is oversight. Some of us have come and gone and so forth, but uh, secretaries have come and gone, undersecretaries have come and gone. We have responsibility. Now, the question I ask, and I think it's an important one, this very small, but this is the claims chart, the flow chart that comes out of this or whatever. I, I would challenge my colleagues. I, I don't know if there's anybody here who knows how this whole process works. And I, and I struggle myself to try and figure this. What I'm trying to mesh up is 
This is the current claim chart, and if our belief is the inputs going into it were greater, all kinds of external factors, we still need to come out with a claim adjudication at some point in time. How do the initiatives, the transformation initiatives, how are these going to blend together to make this thing flow? Because I am having a hard time wrapping my mind around it. I think the frustrations that are being expressed is trying to clearly articulate and know. I would like to know, and if I asked all of you, what happens to me as a 20-year veteran who was in artillery and I'm having a little trouble hearing, and I go in? Where, where does it all start and what happens, and how do I come out the other end? So thank you, Congressman Waltz, for your question. I will tell you that in my years since I've been on staff here, um, and our secretary, our secretary has traveled to 25 regional offices and asked exactly those questions, show me how it works. And they have walked him through from Alaska to Texas to Maine, and I have done the same in the last year. I've been to 26 regional offices where I've told them, make me a claim and walk me through and show me how that works. I will tell you, each one of those initiatives is focused at a particular area where we have seen problems in the process. So if you do a Lean Six Sigma, for those of you who are familiar with those kinds of activities, where you take and break a complete process apart, and then you find the places where you have delays, where you have disruptions, where you have um, uh, problems in the process, we have targeted those 40 plus initiatives at those historical problems. So that is what those initiatives do. The people initiatives help us with segmented lanes, which is an IRS model that worked for them. So we are taking lessons from IRS uh, where we can put things that go through quickly through very quickly, things that are very difficult to do through a special operations lane and the body of the rest in the middle. That has made a difference in the ways in which we can get some of those easy ones done. Under we have learned other things as well. Undersecretary, and I ask you this, you have a long distinguished career, you've been successful in where you've been at, you have taken on, and thank you for doing so, an incredible challenge. You're going to be judged by the outcomes of this. The outcomes do matter. Are you comfortable that if we came back here in 18 months that we will see a significant change? Because I, I would have to say, I, I think probably skepticism is a healthy point here. My fear is, though, is not only this committee, but the veterans are moving from skepticism to, to cynicism on the process. Are, are you comfortable, I mean, to, to lay that on the line? Because what we're asking is we'll give you the tools necessary to get there. You're going to be looked at and asked that question. Do you have the ability to crack that cultural uh, malaise or whatever it is to get through to the other side? Congressman Waltz, uh, I will tell you that uh, I, uh, more than what, and I, I value what you all think of me in the end of the success, but more, even more than that is the 23 million veterans who are out there, many of which watching today, and I want to tell them that I am committed to do this. We are committed to get through it. Change is hard. It is hard no matter who does it and where they do it, but we are tackling it. We've put out the right kinds of resources to do this right. I have a program management office that makes sure I do everything before I have to do the next thing and be on time and be on track. I've engaged with labor to make sure we're doing it right. They understand what we're doing. I've gotten every single one of the memorandum of understanding signed by our great labor partners in everywhere we're going. We are all in on this. Do you feel an effort of this magnitude has ever been made on the claims process? I do not. Okay. That doesn't shy me away from doing it. As you mentioned, I was an Air Force general officer on the air staff, and I led an effort in my last career assignment to stand up 40, 140 new missions in the United States Air Force, and nobody wanted to do it. And today, there are UAVs flying over Afghanistan in support of our war fighters that I got to put there despite the fact that nobody wanted to fly a UAV at that time in the Air Force. We will make it happen. And I appreciate that. We care about that. our veterans, their family members, and their survivors. We're all in this together. I think our charge is, is that uh, this, this is one of those cases failure is not an option. It is we not an option. We have to get there. So I yield back. Thank you, um, Mr. Walls. Um, I'd like to do a second round of questions if anyone has one. Because um, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about the, the scanning issue. Um, why did it take this committee? calling a hearing for the VA to, to meet with NARA uh, to discuss next week's scanning uh, contract expiration. I mean, it, this, this is, I think, the, the frustration that is felt around here is that it's, it's these sorts of things that, that we find out about. And why isn't, it, why isn't there some sort of proactive movement before this? Can you, can you give us an explanation of why the contract is, is set to expire next week? There isn't a contract. 
is there a somewhat other, other plan that um, that the VA uh, VBA is planning on on implementing? Is it going to be done in house? Um, I mean, I know for um, us congressional offices, we have folks that we could use to scan uh, things in. I'm sure you know your system is a little bit more complicated, but you know we're spending 10 million dollars a year, if I remember the number correctly. I mean, it seems like we could do it cheaper, and it seems like we could get it done. Is there a plan to address that? Congressman, I mean, uh, Chairman Stutzman, yes, there is. I will defer uh, the first part of it to, uh, to uh, my uh, Assistant Secretary for Information Technology, Roger Baker. Thank you. So I just wanted to talk to the, uh, to the NARA piece. NARA has been our partner on this for, for two years. So let me start with, will we have an agreement with them by the end of this week uh, to continue them for the next year? I believe the answer to that is yes. I know that's in process. I checked with my staff while we were listening to, uh, to this go on. I got absolute assurances that there was really nothing standing in the way of that completing by the end of this week. So it's, it's a little bit different than a normal government to contractor relationship. Because it's a government to government relationship, it's much easier to do. Um, we've used NARA primarily from a development standpoint. As we developed the VBMS, the relationship with NARA has been in my organization and coming out of my appropriation. As we transition VBMS from development into full production, we will move to a production level of scanning. Uh, NARA will continue on work with us. I believe they set the 600,000 uh, scanning pages layer level. But I think you also heard them mention the kind of level we need to get to, which is about 60 million pages a month. And that's a private sector commercial uh, level of scanning on that. Let me uh, just turn it to the Under Secretary for a second to talk about that acquisition that's ongoing. Could you, do you know the cost of that? What's that going to cost? We, we have an acquisition out right now. We don't know the exact cost of that because it, it usually is, is priced on a per page. Uh, standpoint. So depending on the per page that comes back. And Chairman Stutzman, I would be a little concerned we have an active acquisition at this point in time about uh, talking about too much broadly around it while we're going through that active okay, acquisition. Let's go back then. The why, why the delay? I think that's what, you know, the, the questions, an, an incident like this it doesn't give us confidence that the job is going to get done. Because this is about veterans, not about contracts for uh, between uh, agencies and, and I'm sure I know that it can be done more quickly and that's good but but why is it taking you know a, a hearing why is it taking so long for a contract to be renewed why I mean it seems like you're really imposing on the goodwill of another agency and that you know well it, it they're going to just keep doing it. I mean, we've got to handle this like a business. So, uh, Chairman Stutzman, I will, uh, I will say we have been in d discussions with NARA for, uh, for some time about uh, our relationship. And, and uh, over time, uh, we realized uh, that as we were developing uh, this, uh, this past uh, winter, our uh, requirements for uh, ingest, or I'm sorry, intake, we call it ingest, meaning taking the ability to consume the data, uh, we were learning more and more about uh, that intake strategy, and we now have an intake strategy that initially does depend on scanning, but over time, uh, and not over a lot of time, very quickly, we are going to move increasingly to a strategy that also includes data-to-data -data interface. What I mean by that is as we were discussing and briefing our stakeholder uh, stakeholders in the v veteran service organizations and in your states at the directors of veterans affairs um, offices, they were talking to us about rather than scanning, why don't you let your system connect to our system at a data to data level? That was a recently January timeframe new discussion that shifted some of our requirements for scanning. So in those discussions with NARA, um, NARA uh, and, and we both came to a mutual agreement that uh, they would continue to sustain uh, the level they have been doing with us, but that we probably needed a more short-term, uh, big commercial capability to move uh, the solution that they have developed into uh, production as we move forward. Um, staff just handed me the, um, the documentation or the slides that, that you had given to the, uh, the presentation you had given to staff. Uh, regarding the plan, and I'm just reading through this and, and glancing through this. I mean, it looks more like a presentation about the, um, you know, the, the statistics, the the problem that we know that we have. I mean, are you going to produce a, a plan in addressing the backlog? A written out plan that could be even presented to the committee. Chairman Stutzman, we have a concept of operations that's in a written document. If you prefer a word uh, document that describes all the details uh, listed in that 
um, particular uh, slide deck. I don't know if that's the full and complete one. The full, it looks too short to be the full and complete, all the details. I do know that, I, that we spent several hours with the staff, and I'm happy to do it again. I'm happy to do whatever you need, whenever you need it. I, I think the more information right now would be would be helpful, and this is what uh, staff was was handed. At yeah, this is the full copy of the presentation that you provided when we met with you. Um, if it's shorter and there's more to it, uh, we didn't receive anything additional to what's right here. Wow. We will certainly provide that to the committee. Okay, thank you. Any other members? Have, Mr. Filner. When you were asked, "Do you have a plan?" You said, "Yes, we provided to committee." This is not a plan. This is not a strategic plan. I'll ask you again, do you have a strategic plan? And why don't you just have it with you and give it to us? That's the title of this uh, hearing. Do you have a plan to give to us this minute? I do have a plan, Congressman You have what? Fulner. I do have a plan. I do not have it in this book and these materials. I'm happy to provide to the committee. Why are you providing it with us and a plan of execution? You're going to provide it to us. Why don't you have it here? You have 18 people here work for you. Give us the plan. That's all we asked for. And you said you did it. We don't, we have some slides. We don't have a strategic plan of how you're going to execute this so-called transformation, which sounds more like a fossil formation. So where is the plan? So Congressman Filner, I have the plan. It's in Word document. The secret one or what? No, it is not a secret document. In fact, I have shared it with veteran service organizations, with our labor partners, with I everyone. I just saw it. None of us have you. seen it. Why don't you have it with you? I will be happy to bring it to you, sir. All right. Thank you. Now, uh, by the way, some, uh, Ms. Mr. Walls, and Mr. Walls, uh, she doesn't need your defense here for her past uh, accomplishments, and I don't need a lecture from you of her past. We're talking about what she's going to do for the VA now. I'm, I'll stipulate any accomplishments that she's had. I, I respect her service, but if she can't do this job, I don't care what she has done in the past, okay? So don't lecture me about how I don't have respect for someone's past. She's talking about the future, I mean, and the present and the future. And she didn't give one answer or one recognition that there was any problem. In all her testimony, in every answer, this chairman asked her a number of things. She talked for three and a half minutes and didn't give the answer and still doesn't know the answer. So let's talk about what she's doing right here and right now. And I said, if one of your veterans was, and she didn't answer your question, your very good question, Mr. Walls, about the time period of what's going on in, in, in uh, Minneapolis. She just said, oh, time to time we have surges. You asked, are we heading toward a lowest common denominator? And that's, she never answered that. So don't, I mean, be, I think, a little bit more critical of the kind of answers we're getting. Uh, we don't have a plan. This whole hearing was about a plan. If I were her, I would have given out the plan. Uh, but uh, we, still don't, we still don't have one. Uh, and again, Ms. Hickey, if I, was, if I were you, the leadership comes from the top. The top is saying there is no problem. You ask any veteran in my district, in Mr. Walls' district, Mr. Michaud's district, Mr. Stutzman's district, is there a problem? Everyone will say yes. Now, you could say they don't understand fully, their perception is wrong, we've had a surge of this, we did this, we had the Vietnam era. I don't care what you, you have not either acknowledged a problem or say how we're going to get out of it. You, you gave us an assurance of a date. And Mr. Walls asked, uh, I know, it's not a very bright question. Are, are you commit, are, is it going to happen? What is she going to say? No. We've had these questions. We've had these commitments for years and years and years and years. And Mr. Walls asked you another softball question. Has anything been tried as this big before? We have tried every single thing that you have as one of your initiatives has been tried. Every one of them at some point. In fact, we've had far more comprehensive plans than your 40 initiatives lumped together. Nothing has worked. It's gotten worse. And you refuse to admit it, you refuse to acknowledge it, and you don't give us a plan to fix it. What am I to think? Well, she was an Air Force general that did great things. Are you gonna, uh, if it doesn't happen by 2015, are you going to say I resign or what? Are you going to happen if, if you're the top? And it's always two or three years out. It's never, I'm going to do this tomorrow. I'm never going to do You've been working on this. Your predecessor is working on it. I don't have any assurance. I can't, you can't even correct a date on the computer for a year and a half, and you call it a glitch. 
What confidence do I have that you can do anything if it took you a year and a half to fix a glitch? On a simple, the simplest thing, put a date in. I could have done it by hand in a few months. It took you a year and a half, you still haven't done it, and well, I'm sure we'll get a memo from you. I just bet, you want to make a bet right now, that you'll ask for another extension. I just bet. When's that going to be done? Well, why should we have any confidence in 2015 that a system of a million, of a million uh, backlog is going to be fixed when we can't even get a glitch fixed in a year and a half? What gives me the confidence? That you were an Air Force general? Sorry, it doesn't work. Give me some confidence. What has worked so far? Everything has been a problem. Would you like me to answer what has worked so far, Congressman Filner? Yeah. I'd be happy to do so. At, at more than a We have a pilot based processing system that's being tested out of Congressman Waltz's regional a, a, office in St. Paul. A, a rules-based processing system that's being tested out of Congressman Waltz's very good regional office in St. Paul uh, that has produced the results of the ability to send what is, what is a claim that doesn't require a rating, which is another million claims in our bucket that we do every day, and when we push it through that rules-based processing system this week, it takes us four days. It used to take us 104 days. So how, when is that going to be replicated to our whole system? It used days. When is that going to be replicated to our whole system? When is that going to be replicated to our whole system? Let the witness answer the question before I, I hear it. She said uh, some pilot worked. When is that going to be replicated to the whole system? We are making those decisions right now as we speak, Congressman Filner, and we will have that system uh, a as soon as we go through making sure we have all the training right for our employees so we don't ask them to do something. We've not laid out in what we call a playbook that we have for every single one of no these You have no playbook for anything. That tells General. everyone how to do these You have no playbook for anything. I haven't seen it. I've asked for it. You said we got it. It doesn't exist. Congressman Filner, would you like me to tell you something else that's working? I hear it worked in Minneapolis. I want to know if it's going to work in San Diego, in Seattle, in, in Jacksonville, and in uh, everywhere else, and what time, and you can't even give me, you say we haven't got a playbook yet. Give me a time that it's all going to come together. These are one of I our new initiatives. I can do anything in one office. If, would you like me to give you another thing that worked, yeah, give Congressman me another thing. Filner? Please. Fully developed claims. We have done fully developed claims uh, with the support of our veteran service officers who we cannot, we really depend on highly to help us in this regard. And I have great respect for what they do for our veterans every single day. Fully developed claims we do in 117 days. That's well below the 125 day, 98% quality that we will do in 2015. 117 days we do a fully developed claim. We passed that in 2008, madam. Would you like another thing? We passed thing it in 2008. Would you we like passed another? a law demanding that. That's Would five you? years later now. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, yeah. does the ranking member yield back? Mr. Michel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, quick question. Uh, will the VA be updating the disability uh, benefits uh, questionnaire to allow physicians to state a critical nexus opinion as recommended by uh, the American Legion? Thank you, Congressman Michaud, for your question. I will tell you next week we are actually meeting to update the DBQs with all the great inputs that people now who have been using them for about a month think and have brought forward some good ideas, and I highly encourage us, and I will take it back personally and make sure that that idea is inserted to, into that process to look at it for, for an option. Okay. I will tell you on the DBQs, when, when the decision, when we had them all approved and we had them available to our veterans, I made the decision to go ahead and put them out there to help our veterans as much as possible. We are simplifying those in a much easier user way for our doctors, both private medical physicians and our VHA doctors to use. And that, that capability is being built as we speak and literally next week. I already took the demonstration on it. It looks great. DOD is going to use the same thing to help on our seamless process we do with our service members who are leaving service. Thank you. And I just want to follow up uh, from the first question I mentioned uh, <coughs> earlier as far as the, uh, the Inspector General report. It's, and I'll quote, uh, RVSRS told us they often did not return the inadequate reports due to the pressure to meet productivity standards. We continue to see this as an issue in our fiscal year 2012 revenues uh, reviews. 
So there evidently is some type of productivity standards out there uh, that they have to meet, and it's because of that pressure that uh, that they're moving forward with these uh, claims that uh, I believe is causing part of the uh, uh, the inaccuracy. So, what is that stand productivity standards out there that at least that these employees feel that they have to meet? There are different standards of quality, Congressman Michaud, for different levels in the organization and different positions. Uh, but both of them are not just a production standard. There's also a quality standard. So you have to have both standards, not just one or the other. And, and that is helping us to focus on a quality improvement as well. We've instituted those new quality review teams in the, our regional offices in order for us to do a less threatening but get to the point and get the claim done right for our employees, what we call an in-process check, meaning when the quality person comes and finds that you've done something in error and you fix it right away and they instruct you on what you did wrong, it doesn't count against your performance standard. So that we are encouraging our employees to fix things right, a right away, learn from that, and then not make the subsequent error down the road for the next claim. Is, how is that weighted equally as far as accuracy in production? You can actually, and this is, this is important to note, our veterans of today's conflict, Iraq and Afghanistan, are coming to us with a higher number of medical issues per claim. Almost in some cases but we're starting to see 15. And the reason why this is important, if you can give me just a second, okay. Congressman Michaud, is because right now today our standards are if you get one of the 15 things wrong, even if that one doesn't affect the veteran pay, you get a big goose egg for, your, for that claim. We are looking at and will be able to, under the new VBMS technology, look at those medical issues by issue and be able to look at the quality by issue. I cannot do that today in our current paper-bound process. So, well, you confuse me. So the quality and the productivity standards are not weighted equally? From my perspective, they are a both. They are both weighted, both quality and production. They're both weighted, but they both weighted equally. There is a balance between them. Yes, Congressman Michaud. Okay. Uh, no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Walls. Thank you, Ranking Member. And fixing this thing is the ultimate goal. However, we have to get there to do that. And, and I think at a point, and I'll certainly say it, I take responsibility sitting on this committee as being part of that. I will not be part of the problem with it. I apologize to the ranking member if there was any uh, disrespect, because it was never intended to be that. Your passion for veterans is never questioned. And, and, and I will say on this, uh, of trying to get this thing done, we need to know the past is prologue on certain things. We went into 2005 with a billion dollar shortfall in the VA, because we were told these wars would last weeks, not months. Now we're a decade later. These are costs of war that we're talking about. These are long-term prognoses. I'm just fearful that if we compartmentalize and we silo again, we don't bring into the greater uh, effect of this. We're going to have, we have aging Vietnam veterans. We're going to have aging Iraq veterans and Afghan veterans. And my thing, we'll be right back here again trying to get at that. So a couple of quick questions. Was NARA better qualified at the data entry than any private sector entity? I would... Uh I don't believe necessarily. I believe it was a partner during the development. Uh, okay. We needed somebody with expertise that we could access quickly, uh, and it's much easier to access another government organization. Uh, I believe the skills for doing that work could potentially have been accessed from the private sector, okay. which is why we're looking at it at the large volume being a private sector uh, piece. Um, but we believe they were the right partner for the developmental stage of VBMS. Because, I, and I will, in, in dealing with, and I think the frustration on the bonuses is there, but I'll also be the first to say I will not allow good public servants to be thrown under the bus for trying to do their job. I will also not defend them if they're not. When we've got this, we have to use the best that we have. This is about delivering care. This is about what we know. It's not the either-or proposition of the private sector versus the government alone. It's the, it's the hybrid model of public-private partnerships to get this done. I want to make sure we're utilizing those. I want to make sure we give the tools necessary because uh, this situation, and we, we feel hamstrung by this too. I guess at certain times, of, of just trying to make these command decisions to get it done. We, we have an opportunity here. The public is absolutely with us. They are telling me in my district, do what's necessary, but don't waste money on this. Do what's necessary to care for our veterans. Do what's necessary to speed up the process. And I know their successes every day, and I can know their successes on the VHA side every day. But again, asking a veteran to wait, asking a veteran's claim to be drawn down, it, it's simply 
If it is so complex that we can't explain it to our constituents in a minute or two, that becomes a real problem for them. And when I look at that flow chart, I don't know what it means. I, I'm really struggling with trying to get through this. So I, I say again, all the frustrations here are for the right cause. I, I certainly don't see a softball question asking a general who's performed whether she can get this thing whipped or not and try to live with those consequences. I think the respect goes with that. But that is the reality. It is going to be there, uh, Under Secretary. Uh, and I, I accept that, uh, and I accept that oversight. I yield back. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, from this committee for, for being here. Um, obviously, we've, we're expecting um, some, uh, some follow-up. Um, one, I would like uh, the number of bonuses uh, VBA senior executive um, were, were given, um, and also for your headquarters staff. And if you don't have them here, if you could please provide them for the record to the uh, staff. And then also the, the plan that was uh, being discussed and that you mentioned, if you could also have that uh, delivered as well before, um, before closing. And then um, and also um, we just want to let you know that we appreciate um, uh, the testimony. Uh, we recognize it's a tough job, but it, our, our veterans are counting on it. And we have a responsibility to answer the, um, our veterans back home. You have a responsibility to the veterans, and I know you know that. Um, and, uh, but we want to see this turned around and go the other way. Um, with that, um, if uh, any member has any closing statements, just ask that you submit that in writing. And uh, <laughs> um, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material. Hearing none, uh, so ordered. I uh, thank the members for being here, and I thank the panel for being here. You are dismissed. And this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>